I can call the meeting order and then yeah, there we go. Okay, I'm going to call this meeting order. In the absence of uh, Reed Smith, uh, I will take the chair. Um, we don't have any delegations or deputations. Uh, any problem with the agenda? Any changes? Can I approve of the agenda, then, please? Wanda and Doug, all in favor? Very, thank you. Any conflicts of pecuniary interest and the general nature thereof? None declared. Uh, this is a meeting, a public meeting, uh, to provide information on uh, a couple of zoning applications. Is that right, Jason? Your zoning applications, right? And a uh, consideration of a, a draft canvas uh, bylaw. Uh, we'll start off with the manager of development services stands and uh, uh, item one is a uh, Kennedy application form and uh, so on and so forth. Take it away, Jason. Thank you, Secretary Wise. Um, just with respect to application D04 2022, uh, site specific zoning bylaw amendment application uh, on property owned by Mr. Ron Kennedy, uh, the application proposes to instill and create a site specific zone for the staff for storage of pools and related accessories. Uh, Mr. Lindsay Mills is present at this meeting uh, virtually um, on, on Zoom, and he is representing both Ron and Paul Kennedy, the owners and applicant for this application. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Lindsay to provide the overview uh, and, and walk through the proposal with respect to the planning application. Lindsay, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, so thank you, Mr. Sands. Um, this is an application. Um, I don't know how to report your targets, but the, the application um, is basically, uh, if I was to sum it up, it's um, the purpose of the zoning is to permit open storage with a retail component associated with the firm of each of the pools and TTA limited. Um, in this case, the storage items are fire, fireglass swimming pools, hot tubs, uh, and related accessories uh, that are periodically shipped to a sales area located elsewhere. Some accessory sales of the related paraphernalia is also proposed on the site. The land will be rezoned from the world to a special world session zone and will permit the storage of retail uses in addition to the other uses already permitted in the uh, world zone. The property is 10.1 hectares in size, it's vacant. Uh, one of the things to note is that the uh, rail line runs right through the development, kind of bisects it. Um, so, uh, my report reviews the relevant documents, so official policy statement, the county official plan, and the township official plan. They all seem to support the proposal. Um, I think one of the things to note in the township official plan is that it, uh, section 4.2.8 says that um, rural, commercial, and industrial uses are, are mostly uh, proposed to be within a list. Business Park, which is located at the southwest corner of the township. However, it has that the policies of the plan are also intended to provide for small scale industrial commercial uses at the rural area, serving or related to the rural economy. List a number of such uses, but um, it says uh, <coughs> uh, any uses that may be deemed necessary and appropriate by council. So, um, my, my summation and my report basically says that um, the proposed storage use appears to be compatible with the surrounding large lots. Um, I did an MDS calculation, so no, it turned out to be a non issue. Uh, so, the current property is large, 10.1 hectares, it seems lovely to accommodate storage of these large items. Because the land tends to 
Fallen over this towards the rail line, where it's high point, approximately 120 meters from the road. The store items can be located over on more land behind this rise, where they will not be conspicuous, conspicuous or visually imposing. <coughs> In addition, let's note that the, the um, owner has constructed a roofing berm across the land, it's already there now, uh, to, go ahead, to provide a further visual screening. Thus, the only adverse effect on the neighbor and rural community will be transporting pools and hot tubs to and from the site. But the way I look at this is it's kind of similar to the movements of uh, farm machinery and products. So I don't think it's going to be uh, detrimental to the surrounding community. Um, so I attached a, a, just a very preliminary draft file on. And um, so basically, the model just says, in addition to all the other uses of the world's home, the storage use is also permitted. And I've also included a special front yard uh, of 130 meters to make sure that the storage uses are located behind the room. So that sounds it up. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mellis. Do you have any, anything to add, Jason? Before I go to council, thank you, Dr. Reed. The only question I have for Mr. Mills is if he could expand upon the retail component of the proposal. It was my understanding through the original submission that it was for outdoor storage um, and not necessarily a, sort of a retail component to that from this property, as it was my understanding that the infrastructure, the pools, and related materials would be shipped elsewhere. Um, I just I just wonder if you could provide that clarification for both staff and, and council at this at this time. Yeah, go ahead, Mr. Mills. Yeah, that's for you, Mr. Mills. Yes, it is. Okay. Um, the retail component is not necessary. Uh, he thought he would just add that, just in case he had to sell paraphernalia like that pumps or pipes. Uh, Associated paraphernalia, uh, he has told me that it's not that necessary to have that component. He has 40 sites that he sells these pools from, so it's not a big concern. Thank, thank you. I just, I just wanted to ascertain that information for the benefit of council and any member of the public who may be watching. Um, I think we had some of that preliminary conversation, um, and I think it was maybe. Uh, not that clear in the planning report or for the overview, so that was very helpful. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Yeah, thank you. Um, Council, any uh, questions, comments, concerns? Dr. Like Kevin. Um, my question is the property to the east of that lot where the house and barn are, and that. Um, yeah, so the property to the east where the house and barn are that McKenzie's own, and behind that there was a storage area there as well. I don't know whether it's still there, I haven't been by there. Um, but anyway, um, that was my question that I was thinking of earlier, is there going to be a retail business right there? And if so, why wouldn't it be a commercial, commercially uh, ready um, rather than just uh, the rural? <laughs> No, we'll just tell me more apply to that property. Those, uh, those uh, storage items uh, have already been approved. And he wants to legalize the storage on the subject property now. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Doug, go ahead. Yeah, I, I mean, on my comment, I, I think we've done from what I can see an excellent job of it. Uh, storage of the pools there behind that berm that don't have a drug, they, they will not be visual and be no different from really storing farm machinery in that there. It's just a lump sum that's being stored on the property. So I, I think it's uh, adequate for what's going on. Anyone else? Kevin, did you have a follow up? Go ahead. Yeah, I did, this, the property to the east again of that, do they have a retail? Um, Business there for the for the pools. Um, no, there's no 
the zoning reestablishes or reaffirms that it has there is no obligation for the township to maintain the road. That's the cause for the zone, the ROS zone. So again, I've drafted a uh, so I want to touch the report for your consideration of the job. My recommendation was that uh, this was the state road. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Uh, any further comment, Jason, before I go to council? Thank you, Mr. Um, just my final comment to that. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Um, the way in which the parcel is oriented today, it would result in split zoning. So RLS zoning, limited service residential for a portion of the property that fronts the water, as well as the rural zone, our youth zone for the portion of the property that is located on the step side of Wyoming Lane. So this application is to ensure that there's one uh, consistent zone, as well as limit any development in that very narrow strip adjacent to the water and require that future development be located a compliant 30 meters from the lake, which is on the, um, the larger portion, if you will, on the south side of Island View Lane. Thank you. Any questions, comments, Council Linda? Go ahead. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, there, there was some talk about a, a unmaintained road, and I, I just didn't really see it in any of the diagrams. Now, there is the first diagram has some pretty heavy black felt lines. Are they representing the unmaintained road giving access to all those cottages along the road? If you flip to the uh, sketch at the at the sketch, I'm not sure which one it is in the actual agenda, the visual agenda. Yeah, I think I've got it. Council, uh, you can see that the waterfront properties identified as part nine, part eight, part seven, part six. So those are those are already developed waterfront lots that front of Beaver Lake. And the parts at the south end of those, so part 22, part 21, part 20, part 19, for example, that's the location of the private road or the private lane. Um, so it's at the bottom, it's at the southernmost point of those existing waterfront lots. And you can see that it actually crosses and bisects as part 15 on this proposed severed parcel. Okay, yes, I can see that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, my question is, does Mr. Bradshaw have um, a deeded access on that private road? Sure, you yes, yes, Councilor Peters. Thank you. Anything else? Um, so is Island View Lane, is that the private road? That's what I thought. It's it's very well maintained, yeah, but it's it's not a township road. Okay. Anyone else? Any other comment? Okay. I guess I guess now. Oh, Kevin, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to make a motion to receive the report. Yes. Uh, Kevin moves. Doug seconds. All in favor? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Okay. Items for information, 6A, interim control bylaw and uh, draft bylaw regarding cannabis adjacent. Thank you, Dr. Rebois. Um, <coughs> as many of you already know, Mr. Mark Tao has joined me this evening from the IBI group as IBI group commenced the interim control, I'm sorry, not the interim control, they commenced some preliminary work with respect to cannabis cultivation and zoning bylaw updates for our neighbor at Addicts from Island. And IBI group has historically provided us with planning assistance in the township of Stone Mills. So we thought for efficiencies uh, that they could assist us in the preparation and conclusion of what we've historically adopted here through our interim control bylaw as it relates to cannabis cultivation. The background study uh, is on the agenda for this evening for consideration of the public uh, as well as council. It's fairly lengthy in its, in its documentation, and I think it's very thorough with respect to what I've completed. 
In addition to that background study, there's a draft site specific bylaw that would introduce some of the policy, uh, some of the requirements, like legislative requirements, um, getting into finer details, for example, of the actual separation distances, the actual definitions of cannabis, and how that may or may not be applicable in certain areas like hamlets or rural, rural areas. Uh, it also prescribes specific tipping points um, of number of plants that are to be grown uh, and, and cultivated, for, for example. So that is a, a high level. I will pass it off to Mark if he wants to get into any of the specifics of the background study, draft bylaw, um, and we can try and answer any questions that you and or uh, public may have. But don't see any members of the public with us this evening. The other thing I would like to mention is that this uh, interim control for bylaw has been out for public comment for nearly 16 months, and we have not received any, I would say, valuable input with respect to how to regulate the use um, that we brought forth this evening. Um, we also put it on the agenda at the previous meeting for information sake to try and uh, see if that would essentially spark or instill any comment from, from the public, and that's not been received yet. So I just wanted to provide that for information sake. Okay. Thanks, Jason. Um, so as Jason said, we prepared the background study, which is the land use study um, on the agenda, and this is partly building on the work that we did for Ashton Highlands. Uh, really last year and the year before, dealing with essentially the same issue, uh, which was uh, large-scale, typically um, large-scale growing operations in rural areas that created a number of uh, nuisance negative impacts off-site, typically related to odor, uh, but also um, activity levels, I would say, on the site, um, significant you know, deforestation in some areas or clearing, um, as well as uh, significant accessory structure development, which um, sometimes created building code compliance concerns, um, and also introduced a, a, a very difficult type of land use to regulate through existing zoning um, that was also hampered by or impacted by uh, federal licensing and regulation that. Um, was in place or is in place, but wasn't necessarily um, enforced uh, like the municipality would enforce it in terms of having boots on the ground to investigate sites or investigate operations. So, um, the interim control by was passed, uh, and the land use study that uh, we undertook looked at what is the issue, uh, what are possible solutions to it, what existing um, regulation is in place or we're using uh, tools are available to municipality to, to regulate the use and then we made um, recommended changes to the zoning bylaw and the, the recommendations really cover three areas so one is um, creating a separate definition for cannabis production cannabis uh, growing and that really separates it into um, two categories one is personal cannabis production which would be a small scale of what somebody would grow in their own private residential property. And then the second uh, category is commercial scale, so something like an can in that knee, where it's within an industrial commercial building, uh, typically all indoor growing um, and processing uh, highly licensed or highly regulated licensed federal facility. Um, and then also creating uh, updated definitions for agricultural use to make it clear that cannabis is considered an agricultural crop um, so that a municipality wouldn't end up in a situation where somebody could grow cannabis outdoors at uh, a large scale. Um, somebody would have to come in and seek an amendment to allow that, but more likely, and um, certainly in the current regulatory environment from the federal government, they would throw it inside a facility anyway once you're into that large scale. But, it does deal with that. Um, those issues that arose that kind of precipitated the interim control by law coming into effect. So the definitions were, were one of the three things. The, the second and third things that were are being recommended are to actually create provisions in the zoning bylaw that regulate the smaller scale 
uh, personal growing and then the larger scale, uh, commercial scale growing uh, that would happen through a federal license facility. Um, and so there's definitions defining each of those types of uses, and then there's provisions that specify um, how really the, the primary uh, provision that would uh, regulate those uses is setbacks to sensitive land uses. So identifying that they have to be, in most cases, for a large scale commercial facility, 300 meters from any uh, sensitive land use, such as a house or school or church. Um, and then the personal production, lesser setbacks, but there's also a scale limitation there as well in terms of how many plants and what the growing area is, whether it's indoor or outdoor. Uh, and some of this is based on the research and the work that we did for Ancient Highlands, looking at what other municipalities have done in the province in terms of where the scale was, what the setbacks were, were used. Uh, I would say that um, the recommendations here and, and what we're doing in Ancient Highlands are probably in the generally conservative, middle to conservative side of things in terms of the setbacks that are employed as a right. Um, but I think that's probably a, a given the sensitivity of the use, it's probably the best way to proceed. And if somebody does come in and wants to do something specific on their property, they always have the option of the variance application or the zoning application. And then that gives the municipality the opportunity to specifically evaluate that proposal and also maybe apply conditions um, to if there were a reduction in setback, for example. Maybe it's warranted because it's a smaller scale facility or it's located very in a very isolated location, those types of things. Um, so I think the recommendation to those more conservative, larger setbacks um, is, is justified in that sense. And then there is the opportunity for someone to come in and ask for a reduction if if that becomes uh, if that comes to pass in the future. I would say just in practice, we've seen and we Look at the news, the cannabis industry in the last year to 18 months has really um, suffered, I guess, in terms of investment in commercial growing. Uh, post legalization there was a big boom, and that's why we saw this rush, some of which uh, turned into legal activities growing. Um, and, but now, in the last, I said, 12 to 18 months, um, a lot of the facilities that maybe were interested in opening up in places like Matthew or Stone Mills. Um, the competition and the, the market is really falling out of the front of them. So the likelihood of having a flood of applications in some mills is probably pretty, pretty low. So I think the issue has, the market has almost corrected the issue, I guess. Um, but nonetheless, the proposed bylaw, the recommended provisions of the bylaw would allow this to probably regulate where they would go. It would require rezoning to permit them outside of the industrial park in terms of a commercial scale facility. And then we employ uh, significant setbacks for any personal production, as well as scale limits on any personal production, which would hopefully mitigate any potential impacts um, due to an excess number of plants that produces odor uh, or requires lighting, for example, that is a nuisance to neighbors. So that's the, the recommendation in terms of the high level. If you want to get any of the details or specific numbers, happy to, to do that as well. Jason, our staff, and I have talked to a couple of um, potential changes to the draft bylaw in terms of um, increasing a couple of setbacks um, to unoccupied or vacant lots that would allow a residential use, for example, um, and then just clarifying uh, one of the other provisions about how it's measured to a lot long versus to maybe a building on a property. Uh, other than that, the bylaw that you got in your package is, is what's uh, been recommended. Thank you, Mark. Um, comments, questions, counsel? Doug. Yeah, Mark, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. In, in your uh, work uh, working up with this, Mark, did, did you find any studies or anything that talked about the distances that the odor, the smell would travel? And I'm asking that for particular reasons. Yeah, um, no, we, we certainly. Yes. Um, we looked, and that was part of the part of the struggle with a lot of municipalities in the province um, when we first started looking at Adams Island, probably Adams Island three or four years ago. 
there was one municipality in the province, and the name escapes me right now, that kind of led the charge and kind of figure out what is, what can this guy do to regulate, and then there, and then what's a setback that we could apply that's defensible and that would be effective. Um, and there wasn't really a clear answer other than using, so the 300 meter distance that you see in the bylaw is um, partly drawn from provincial ministry environment setbacks where you, the province classified an industry in three different, but in three different categories. Class one, which is least impactful, class two, and then class three, which is most impactful. And the class three industry, which would be characterized as having you know, outputs like noise, odor, dust, um, smell, or um, that would be uh, regular and obnoxious and be felt off site if there's not appropriate setback, and the setback for class three industry is 300 meters. So that's where that 300 meter number came from. But if you look at the literature, if you look at their studies or you know, read anything online, certainly depending on where the wind's growing or what the scale of development, if it's not in a commercial facility that's got um, proper air treatment, um, it's just open growing, you could certainly stop for further than 300 meters away. Um, so I think that's partly why prohibiting it as a, being grown in large scale outdoors as an agricultural crop at least for, um, eliminates the possibility that you have that really large scale open growing um, that 300 meters wouldn't be sufficient for. And so if you force that scale of growing indoors to a commercial facility, they're supposed to be through the federal licensing process have all sorts of air scrubbers, et cetera, that would limit and uh, reduce that. And we say eliminate if you go to Adcan, for example, and we were to go to the parking lot. Um, I know some people said you could still smell something outside of that facility, but I think that's probably more contained than okay, uh, my concern is, is the smell, mainly uh, I, I'm a uh, I'm not with such a stuff, I don't know anything about it, to be honest with you. Other than I had had the three opportunities, I guess is the right word, to smell. Okay. Um, once a few years ago, I entered a property, and uh, as I got close to the building, the smell knocked me down, uh, basically. And I left the property, and then another location, I used to walk by a old trailer. And we always call it the skunk trailer because I didn't know what the smell was. Yeah. Okay, I was later educated that the smell might have been marijuana growing inside of it. But this, we, we give the trailer a wide berth because we were afraid of skunks. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, it could be very offensive to a lot of people. Recently, uh, in the last couple of years, I walk uh, sometimes for exercise past a piece of property, and it seems to be more predominant at a certain time of year. But I can view the property for several hundred feet and I don't see anything. And yet, I go like this when I'm going by. It's uh, quite a smell. Okay, So I don't know how many plants are growing, but I'm concerned in the hamlet area, not so much the group area, because of the distances, but in the hamlet area, boy, you could affect a lot of houses with that smell. Uh, especially anybody that's having breathing problems, whatever, it may become very difficult. So I'm concerned that 70 meters, although I know that 70 meters would more than cover all small village lots, I'm not so sure it would cover all large, any newer large lots. So a little bit of a concern there. So I'm willing to listen to that argument the discussion. Uh, and that's Kevin, go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, I guess my question was related with, with those. What is the distance? I think I read it there, but what is the distance in a, uh, a building's lot? Uh, what, are, what are the separations? Three units here. Um, so, within, so there's the canvas production personnel, which is. You know, yeah, that's what I'm talking yeah. about the four yeah. plants. Yeah. So, and there's, um, there's two different categories. So, under the curtain, just as you need to get a bit of background. So, um, recreational growing, so if you don't have a medical prescription for cannabis, you're only allowed under um, federal law to grow up to four plants. Um, if you have a medical prescription, 
there is no technical, there's no legal limit. It's whatever quantity of plants you need to meet the prescription, whether and then whether it's you know, smoking it or, or oil or whatever it happens to be. So we we put a limit of 25 plants for personal production, which would limit uh, somebody who has a prescription to growing up to 25 plants on, a, on an individual property. Um, and under the federal regulation, you can actually grow for up to three other, well, you can grow up to four prescriptions on property. Um, so, yeah, so, well, no, it's still limited to a max of 25 plants, so whether you're going for one person or, or four people, you're still limited to a maximum of 25 on a residential property. Um, in the draft, yeah, yeah. So, and the reason, just to give a background, we originally had a much lower number in that time as we did want, to, we were conscious of not being so um, limiting that somebody who had a prescription wouldn't be able to grow it at home because it is cheaper than um, buying it theoretically from a dispensary. It's not covered, for example. Um, so we did want to, we did want to allow some. We got two comments from members of the public in Anderson Highlands that uh, indicated their prescriptions required. 17 and 21 or 23 plants. So that's where that 25 number came from. It was to accommodate a couple of specific inputs that we had in Madison Island. You know, whether or not that's reasonable in Stone Mills, you know, that, that's, the, that's the only kind of source we have for that 25 plants. So the 70 meters, then, whether that's sufficient, if you had maybe just four plants, you know, hopefully that would be enough. If somebody's growing the max of 25 plants, the right at 70. Uh, I don't know. Again, there's no hard science behind you know X plants that people X meters are set back to you know, limit the smell. Um, independent again, if they grow indoors or outdoors, times a year might be, be better or worse. So, um, like I said, this is you know if you take a more um, conservative, restrictive approach, that's probably safer in terms of dealing with potential complaints. And, and the only risk is you might. Um, affect a, a few people who do need more than what the minimum or maximum allow, and then they're compelled to come in and ask for permission. So that's kind of the balancing act that is going to allow us. What the four plants was? Is it seven still seventy? Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. And then sorry, seven. Yeah, sorry. Oh yeah, sorry. So that's. Yeah, so four plants or less, you're you're limited to your existing uh, minimum setbacks for that residential use. Um, so if it's a house, yeah. So if you're just growing four plants or less, then it's whatever the setback is for side yard, front yard, rear yard. But more than four plants, then you're up to seventy. And then if it's in the rural zone, you're limited to a maximum area of fifty square meters, five hundred square feet. And then it's a 300 meter setback that applies. So, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Four plants or less, it is more it's tied to the principal use of that zoning. So, it's the same. The way it's currently drafted is it's the same as if you were putting an addition on the rear of your house in a hamlet on a small lot. You have a five meter interior side yard. So, you could grow your three plants behind your back door, back patio door on that property. Compliant with those yard setbacks, that would be for four or less. When you get into the 25 tipping, yeah, yeah. tipping so five to 25, yeah. Sorry, yeah, five to 25, that range, that's where you're getting the 70 meters away from neighboring property lines. Yeah. 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 Any further comments or questions from council? I, I do have some clarification questions. Um, so you mentioned, Mark, that uh, uh, the purposes of this draft bylaw um, we're not considering cannabis as an agricultural crop. I'm wondering federally, under federal legislation, is it considered an agricultural crop? Yeah, they have. Um, um, there's been varying, varying changes in the legislation since it came out, and I believe uh, federally it feels that the definition is considered comparable crop. And so there is some consideration that cannabis could be grown uh, open growing from the federal government. Like that's an approved 
way of growing from the federal government's perspective. Um, but in doing the research and looking at other municipalities and talking to some of the other municipalities who kind of led the charge and putting in more restrictive provisions, um, I know we've been challenged yet that we're aware of, and, and I don't think there's anything that specifically prohibits municipalities from being more restrictive in terms of limiting growth or adding greater setbacks. I think the concern that's always been kind of floated out there amongst municipalities in doing this is where it's where somebody makes the argument that you're um, impinging on their personal freedoms, I guess, in terms of particular way of medical prescription, where you're allowed technically to grow, federal government has a licensing process, therefore it's the municipality as a creature of the province, and you know, the lower lowest tier of government in the country. Are they allowed to restrict this type of um, type of use through zoning or not? And that's where um, again, I forget the municipality that kind of led the charge in doing this. They, they basically take the position that we're going to do it until we're told that we can't because the federal government doesn't have a lot of you know, people to do inspections or respond to complaints or do any of this stuff, um, and so they are taking it as uh, and there's a gap in the municipality with zoning authority that has the ability to regulate land use and look at impacts. And so that's where these provisions kind of first started in the province about three years ago, or like about three or four years ago. Um, so that's the, that's where they're getting agricultural municipalities, especially with uh, assessments as well. Um, I know that came up in, in amongst other municipalities when the open air growing as an agricultural crop came up as a as kind of a, a new permission, um, whereas before it always had to be in, in buildings. Municipalities being very worried that you're going to have agricultural land for cannabis growing and it's a very low assessment for tax purposes. And so rather than having something that maybe is more appropriately done in an industrial setting, commercial setting, with higher taxes, um, it would be grown in the open air and in agricultural areas with its own set of problems. So this would prevent that from happening in terms of having it as an open air growing and really a commercial, quasi commercial industrial operation um, occurring in the agricultural setting. So by possibly uh, adopting this bylaw, we're doing the uh, better to ask forgiveness than permission kind of approach in terms of federal legislation or, or federal policy at this point. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's consistent with other municipalities around and that's why when we first did the, uh, the update in Agnihan, we did a lot of research looking at what other municipalities have done and talk to other municipalities who have already enacted bylaws. Um, so what we recommended was consistent with that. And even FCM had done some, some work looking at this issue. So it's consistent with all those. And, and and there's nothing that we've seen that prohibits municipalities from implementing these powers. I think, like I said, the real question may come up is if somebody um, who is maybe feels like they're being restricted from growing cannabis, that they should be allowed to be allowed to grow on their own property, that would they be able to challenge mm -hmm. to say that it's ultra or outside of municipalities' power. So I think that's, that's the real risk that it comes down to, um, you know. Is, it, is there a gap in the legislation, yeah. or is it really something that should be exclusively dealt with by the federal government? Right. Yeah. No, there's, and there's, no, yeah, there's no case law that we've seen yet that deals with this. And in terms of uh, uh, within the villages or, or perhaps clusters, uh, which Doug and Kevin both expressed concerns about, um, it seems to me that if, if uh, that this doesn't affect the, uh, the four plants or less people too much, you may get some individual situations where that could cause some conflict. But it essentially, I would say, prevents anyone with a medical marijuana prescription from growing within a village or a, or a close cluster because there, nobody's further away than 70 meters from a lot line in the village. So that's where we may see some, some complaints as well. Um, I'm just throwing that out there as a possibility of uh, some conflict. Uh, Linda, go ahead. Would that be, would that be an opportunity then for 
them to come here and apply for the variant or the rezoning application? Yeah, absolutely. We're going to continue to adjust that. So, so there is a law enforcement council. You can do a specific zoning similar to what we contemplated this evening, or do a minor variant potentially for this outside. Anyone else? Okay, can I get a motion to accept uh, Mark's presentation? Sherry and Deb, all in favor? Any other uh, business that we have to do then, Don, on this meeting? Great, that means I go home and get something to eat. <laughs> and I uh, get a motion to adjourn the cabinet and Doug, all in favor? Great, thank you very much. Thank Mark. Thank you. Thank, I know, uh, sorry, I, think, I know it's been going for We've got 40 minutes here, but I have no idea how much we can get for time frame. Oh, no, that's plenty of time for this yeah. to get into the next. So we, we could have had five people here. Yeah.